You are listening to Episode 2 of The Great Rabbit Hunt, the Soviet POW breakout from Mauthausen, 1945, written and narrated by Mark Felton. This is an audio-only program. The Austrian gendarmerie was reluctant to execute recaptured Soviet POWs. This led to several confrontations between local police and Nazi officials, who were hell-bent on carrying out SS Standartenführer Sierheis' orders to the letter. In the small community of Schwertberg, local police had managed to apprehend seven POWs, but contrary to orders, police chief Johann Kohut had the emaciated men placed in a cell rather than shot. When local Nazi party leader Leopold Birnberger got wind of the captives' presence in his town, he marched into the police station and berated Kahoot, making clear Zierheiser's order. Unwilling to make a stand against Birnberger, Kahoot ordered the cell door unlocked and the Soviets were taken outside. In the yard, Birnberger personally shot all seven prisoners with a pistol. As more and more of the escaped prisoners were hunted down and killed, their corpses were taken back to Mauthausen so that they could be identified and logged. The bodies were then transferred to the camp crematorium and burned. Many of the SKPs that were apprehended by local Austrians were simply shot or beaten to death at the moment of capture. It is interesting to note that the Nazis never forced any of the locals to take part in the hunt. All those that did did so of their own free will. Compassion was outside the remit of the hunt. For example, one Austrian Volkssturm unit delivered a group of live POWs to Mauthausen, only to receive a dressing down from SS officers at the camp for failing to adhere to Commandant Zierheiser's explicit order that had stated that units are not to bring back anyone alive. On the first night of the hunt, 57 live prisoners were brought back to Mauthausen, only to be shot on Zierheis orders. After several days of slaughter, it had become apparent to the SS that some of the escaped prisoners remained unaccounted for. Eventually, the SS authorities determined that of the several hundred who had managed to escape from the camp, between 17 and 19 remained free was obvious that despite dire warnings to the contrary, some local Austrians had risked their lives sheltering fugitives. Red Air Force Captain Ivan Bitukov and Army Lieutenant Viktor Ukrainsev had a stroke of luck when Russian and Polish prisoners, who were being used as farm labourers by the mayor of Holzleiten, spotted them. The farmhands hid the two officers in the mayor's loft while he was out hunting down other escapees. The farmhands gave Bitukov and Ukrainsev clothes, food and shoes, and successfully hid them for 14 days until the SKPs were strong enough to leave and try to reach Soviet lines. Another young Soviet officer, Semyon Sharkov, turned up at a farm near Schwertberg. The farmer, Johann Marschabauer, and his wife had already seen just how ugly the war had become when, on the first day of the escape, searching Nazis had discovered a Soviet SKP hiding in their barn. The Nazis believed Marschabauer when he told them that he had had no idea that the POW was on his property, but they also made sure that Marschabauer and his neighbours would be under no illusions as to what would happen should this occur again. The Soviet officer was dragged from the barn and shot dead in front of Mashabauer, his wife and five children. So when Semyon Sharkov turned up at the Mashabauer farm seeking shelter days later, it would not have been surprising if Mashabauer had turned him away or handed him over to the police. But in spite of the terrible risks to his family, Mashabauer bravely gave Sharkov shelter and successfully hid him until the end of the war. In nearby Winden, another farming family led by Johann Langthaler took in two escaped Soviet officers. Langthaler had five children and his elder son was actually serving in the Volkssturm in Schwertberg and was involved in the hunt for the escaped POWs. Langthaler indicated that the Soviet officers, Mikhail Rabchinsky and Nikolai Zemkalo, climb into the hayloft in his barn and hide. 
Lang Tala later moved the two fugitives into the attic of his house, where they hid until the end of the war. Although these are splendid examples of humanity and compassion on the part of a few brave Austrians, the fact remains that most of the local citizenry either ignored the plight of the escaped prisoners or actively engaged in hunting down and killing them. The entire incident was to prove to be one of the darkest pages in Austria's recent history. Back at Mauthausen, the SS took out their fury at the escape on those prisoners in Block 20 who had been left behind. They were all shot. A single survivor had earlier been found a job with a group of electricians inside the camp and would be able to bear witness after the war. Only 11 Soviet officers from Block 20 who took part in the mass breakout survived the war. It was a pitiful number compared with the 500 who actually managed to escape from the camp and was indicative of the absolute barbarity the Germans showed towards Soviet prisoners of war. With both Soviet and U.S. forces closing in on the region, Commandant Zierheis received orders from higher command to place the camp and its many subcamps into a defensive state. Himmler had issued an order two months after the Great Rabbit Hunt that commanded the SS to kill all remaining prisoners in the Mauthausen complex to prevent their liberation by the Allies. Zierheis ordered the prisoners to construct anti-tank obstacles east of the camp, while non-Jewish German and Austrian inmates were coerced into joining an ad hoc defence unit, the SS Freiwillige Häflingsdivision, commanded by the notorious Oskar Dierlewanger, who was famous for brutally crushing the Warsaw Uprising in 1944. It seems incredible that prisoners should be uniformed and armed to serve alongside SS concentration camp and Ukrainian Trauniki guards, but such was their desperate situation that the Germans permitted such a move. Whilst these preparations were continuing at a feverish pace, Zierheis ordered the execution of sick prisoners to make space for thousands of new arrivals evacuated from camps to the east. Rations were by now reduced to such a degree as to cause widespread starvation. Many of the inmates were members of underground resistance organizations at Mauthausen, and sensing that the end of the war was fast approaching, they decided that they must prepare to defend themselves. It seemed likely that the SS would either force them onto death marches south or kill them all inside the camps. Zierheis did indeed have a plan as per Himmler's order. At the appointed time, thousands of prisoners would be driven into the underground armaments and aircraft manufacturing plants, and the entrances sealed with explosive charges, entombing the unfortunate slave labourers. On the 28th of April 1945, many of the prisoners believed that their time had come when, to the accompanying wail of air raid sirens, 22,000 prisoners were rapidly herded underground by screaming SS guards. Yet for some reason they were not killed, but were permitted later in the day to return to their barracks and work details. Zierheis claimed that his wife had persuaded him not to go through with the plan, but this may simply be conjecture. Even so, Soviet, Polish and French prisoners made plans to assault the main SS barracks to grab weapons and ammunition. On the 3rd of May, the prisoners noticed that the SS was starting to leave. Reports had reached Zierheis that U.S. Army units were approaching, and not wishing to be taken prisoner and face justice for their crimes, the senior SS officers decided to evacuate all but 30 of their men. Unarmed Volkssturm militia and a unit of middle-aged Viennese policemen and firefighters made up the shortfall in guards. Soon after arrival on the 4th of May, the senior police officer met representatives of the prisoners and agreed to the creation of an international committee. To all intents and purposes, Mauthausen was now under the control of the prisoners, and the SS, Volkssturm and police guards only manned the gates and watchtowers, no longer venturing into the various camps. The prisoners immediately ceased all work in the factories. Liberation came the next day, 5th of May, when elements of the 41st Reconnaissance Squadron, U.S. 11th Armored Division, drove up to Mauthausen's main gate. There was no resistance from the remaining guards. 
The enraged prisoners killed all the thirty remaining SS. The following day, the 11th Armoured liberated Mauthausen's many sub-camps. Shortly afterwards, Mauthausen was handed over to the Red Army as part of the Soviet occupation zone of Austria. SS Standartenführer Zierheis disappeared into the Austrian Tyrol, hoping to keep a low profile and avoid apprehension for war crimes. But on the 23rd of May 1945, the 39-year-old former commandant of Mauthausen was captured by American troops. He was shot and wounded while trying to escape custody. Lingering for a couple of days, Zierheis was interrogated by former prisoners in the protective custody hut at Gusen 1, providing a detailed confession of his crimes at Mauthausen before he passed away. His body was subsequently publicly displayed on the wire. The Americans convened the Mauthausen trials in 1946 and 1947, where 69 former members of Mauthausen's staff were tried, along with August Eingruber, former Gauleiter of Upper Austria. 46 were executed by hanging, including Eingruber. You have been listening to The Great Rabbit Hunt, the Soviet POW breakout from Mauthausen, 1945, written and narrated by Dr. Mark Felton. For videos on a wide variety of military history subjects, please visit my other YouTube channel, Mark Felton Productions, details below. You can also help to support both of my channels at PayPal and Patreon, details in the description box.